So this is captured by women. A current affairs shows that examines critically issues that are of relevance to our development from the perspective of women. My name is Matilda Abahins, a communication specialist. And I am Elizabeth Olympio Emmanuel. I'm a restaurateur and a project management consultant. This program is sponsored by Woodin, Woodin Le Create and Emerald Suites. Let's take a look at what we did last week. Initially, it was thought that the ladies had been kidnapped. And so the police started looking into a case of kidnapping. And I think that is why um, all along, kidnap, kidnap, kidnap. Even though um, there was so much, I, think, I, I, I should say, delay in finding the girls. The, 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 the police could not find the girls. <coughs> and they the, the, the kept on saying it was kidnap, kidnap. Some of us spoke on certain platforms. And then we said, time had passed. There is no sign that uh, there is no indication where these girls are, even though we had been assured that, of course, the girls were somewhere and they were safe. But then we were, police were not making progress. So some of us even thought that, well, the, it may not be kidnapping case. It may be a, diff a, case, a different case altogether. It could be abduction for a certain purpose, or it could even be human trafficking. So the police should open up to other perspectives. They, they, should, they shouldn't only be concerned with investigating kidnap, kidnap case. This week on the show, we'll be looking at rosewood, which has become a priceless commodity. What exactly is making this a priceless commodity and where is it going to? The unemployment situation in Ghana Figures released by government shows the present administration has created 1.5 million jobs in less than three years. We shall interrogate this. Two years ago, the Bank of Ghana revoked the licenses of UT Bank as well as the Capital Bank. It's been two years. Staff were dismissed. What is the update? Understanding the new curriculum. The new curriculum will take effect in September this year. We'll help you understand. Up next is SPIN. Two years ago, the Bank of Ghana revoked the licenses of UT Bank and Capital Bank. Staff were dismissed, others were retained. Today, we still have a lot more going on. So Eliza, now we have Consolidated Bank coming out of this process. How good has it been for us in the last two years? It's been catastrophic for a lot of people. Um, the government, I think, injected 12 billion CDs. However, it didn't trickle down to, lend to those whose monies were locked up in these banks nor to compensation to some of these workers. Some of them have been laid off, and I think some are actually taxi drivers. They are driving Ubers. Some are even doing catering. Catering as well. If you look online, a lot of them have actually reinvented themselves, you're right, into catering because they're doing online delivery, home deliveries. They have to think out of the box. But how, what is the, um, why haven't some of these who caused this collapse been brought to book. You know, the Bank of Ghana, the central government, the, the governor of the Bank of Ghana indicated earlier um, last week when we had an interaction with him that um, by the end of this year, there's going to be the prosecution of those who are found culpable, culpable. in, in, in yes. this regard. But I am thinking that the process has taken quite a bit of time because it's been two long years. And, and we know only about the banks, the nine banks, however, 400 micro institutions, so that's the savings and loans, those 400 have been shut down. And a lot of our people, you know, before a bank gives you a loan, you'd have had to send your great grandparents a collateral. <laughs> <laughs> Before they'll give you a loan, what exactly you want, you have to push, prove that amount. But the microfinances take less risk. So a lot of people sent, took their money to these institutions. Yes, the, the interest was higher or um, they were getting more unrealistic returns. Um, returns. But that's where the bulk of suffering is. And I think 
the, the bailout needs to reach some of these people whose monies were locked up in the micro You know, the very worrying bit about it is that we've had to wait for the last two years to deal with these issues. Yes. But if we were really monitoring strictly what these investments were going into, and the Bank of Ghana, again, is, they, is yeah, culpable they, they were for sleeping this. on the job. Yes. They, they must take some responsibility in here because it's taken you, you saw the trend, it was happening. Then you brought in this policy about no one um, using Forex. Then the, 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 the rates fell drastically. Mm -hmm. Then you brought it back again. Just yo-yo and all of this. And this was happening and you wouldn't monitor and police the licenses that you have put out there. No, they must take some responsibility as well. Yes. And you know, we, we've had um, some being downgraded. For instance, the GN Bank being downgraded. That I haven't understood at all. Because Why? you know, um, from the, what the management of GN Bank said, they had um, payments due them from some of these other banks and from government. You know, you, um, Unibank, Unibank also indicated had the same, the, same. the same thing. So why would you do that? Why don't you come to the table instead of collapsing an indigenous institution? Why don't you come to the table and see how best to, to keep it afloat? Because you have so many Ghanaians who, I, I think 3,000 staff mm -hmm. have lost their late. jobs between these nine banks. It's mm -hmm. a whole lot. I think it's a lot more. And then you, you look at the rippling effects because you've had quite a number of people who were also looking after people. They may have had businesses that relied on the financial institutions as well. And if you look at it that way, then it means that you, you've virtually been collapsed tough. some a section it's that have, tough. you know, and yeah. some uh, companies have even folded up because of these. So perhaps from now on, we should do a lot more monitoring. It, sh it should be strict. It, sh it should be. It should be. It's a pity it's gotten to this point, but it's a learning curve. But does it give confidence to the person who wants to go into um, banking, especially if you are an indigenous person? Because it looks more like now, for you most know, people, they thought that it is the targeting of indigenous banks. Having a bank is a big deal. If you want to operate a bank, you have to have money. You're the, the stated minimum capital that you must have set aside so if something hits the fan you should be able to pay off all your uh, depositors the the bank of ghana which is the uh, watchdog of all of this should do better they need to monitor they need to do their job to make sure that if the bank has to be a bank it is capable of being a bank but there should be good uh, classification of these banks because you have the commercial banks, you yes. have the others, and whatever the credit in unions, the credit the, unions. Yeah, the corporatives. Yes. So a concern was that you couldn't lump them all together and raise the capital. And so if you are looking at the recapitalization, then you, it means you should look at what these banks do and classify them and then give them the necessary recapitalization that you expect. So that if, for instance, it's a commercial bank and you are asking for a certain amount, they know that it, it, it cascades yeah. to that level. But if all of them are lumped together, then it means for somebody who is into merchant banking or even construction or whatever, their needs in terms of capital might be different. It's Perhaps the, the central bank must look at that. Central bank, I think they, they announced that they are also going to be cleaning up the savings and loan sector as well. So there's a few more heads to roll because... I'm sure <laughs> they will find guilty the parties fear there as well. Is the effect on banking, because who would think? Perhaps once you. I'm going to keep my money <laughs> under my pillow. Under my pillow. You do, and that's going to be wrong because you'll be giving jobs to the people who will come at midnight. Very bad. Very bad. No, the Bank of Ghana needs to reassure us and uh, do do the right thing. Make sure everyone is uh, towing the line of order. Yeah. It's a good thing they're doing it now. It may have happened a bit too late, but better late than never. No. <laughs> Coming up next on Captured by Women is unemployment. Do stay with us. <laughs> Figures released by government shows the present administration has created 1,500,000 jobs in less than three years. This figure 
is being challenged by many. Joining us today is Mr. Justin Kodia Frimpong, CEO of the Youth Employment Agency, YEA. Justin, you're welcome to Captured by Women. Thank you very much. Now, Justin, would you know exactly how many jobs have been created in the last three years? Um, basically, um, this pronouncement was made by my sector minister, Honorable Ignatius Bafuowa. And I think it was on May Day. And um, he did a review or analysis from 2017, the jobs that has been created by this current administration. And uh, the figure 1.5 was mentioned, which I believe is even on the lower side. Do we have any empirical data that yes. points to these numbers? Yes, certainly, because um, the, the figures did not come out of the blue. Okay. Um, definitely, it was compiled from various sectors of the economy, even including YEA, NAPCO, um, from audit surveys, from health ministry, from Ghana Education Service. So it's, it's, it's a combination of figures from the various sectors. So which brackets or age groups are we looking at? Uh, majority will be in the youth bracket. Uh, majority because uh, normally when recruitments are being done, unless it's for certain strategic or specific mm. positions, and most of them are at the top level where they will say maybe the minimum age should be 40 years and above. But by practice, most recruitments are done from 18 years and even some say maximum 30 years. Let's say the, the, the three okay. major um, industries that have benefited from this, which uh, industries are we looking at? Uh, mostly in the service sector. Hmm. Mostly in the service sector. Then uh, followed by the industry. Uh, industry and uh, la uh, last not least will be in the agriculture sector. So is, is it a skilled form or it's just um, for temporary employment? Um, it's both. Some, some are in the nature of permanent jobs, some are also contract jobs and some are Which one is job. on the higher side? Um, they, basically most of them are on contract jobs to be honest with you. Is and, it uh, safe? Yes, um, it, it's safe in the stand that um, remember Ghana had um, a relationship or an arrangement with IMF, mm. which were, there were uh, fees on public sector recruitment. And in order to come out from that um, practice, the government needed to come out with temporary measures to absorb our teaming young men and women who couldn't get permanent jobs. So most of them was a temporary measure to deal with the IMF situation. And as I speak to you now, with Ghana coming out from IMF, there has started being massive recruitment um, from, uh, from temporary jobs to permanent jobs. Let me take you back to numbers. The Ghana Statistical Service uh, published in 2017 the rate of un unemployment at 11.9%, yeah. stating that 1.2 million youth workforce were unemployed. Is this to say with the recent um, pronouncement by the sector minister that we have had 80 percent increase in employment um the minister had the media perception to, uh, and uh, at that discussion the figure 11.1 percent has yeah. gone down to seven point around 7.5 7.8 that's okay. if you are using the broad employment analysis and um, if you're also looking at the, the restrictive employment analysis, that one is around 3.7, and I will explain uh, that one to you. Um, the reason being that there are people who genuinely are looking for jobs and have gone f for interviews or have applied for a certain number of jobs, but they didn't get the opportunity. So those facts are there. And uh, according to the minister, it's estimated around f over 400,000 people who out of their, own, of their own, they went out to search for job. Then also, the broad employment analysis look at people who maybe for one reason have given up, that they don't feel that even if they apply, they will hear something from, from the various uh, employers or the em uh, employee industries who are in their various homes. And that figure is also pegged around 400 to 500,000. So, if you look at one angle under the restrictive, 
you can say that unemployment has reduced, reduced to 3.7. But if you want okay. to be realistic, to factor in people that you might not have captured or people who have not even gone out yeah. to look for a job, then you can peg it at 7. Point Why five. then does the Afrobarometer place us as one of the worst performing countries in regards to the SDGs? I think we are placed number 45. Uh, certainly, it is it's possible, and if 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 you do comparative in regards to job creation, yes, if you do comparative analysis, it's countries on the African continent have higher level in terms of perform in terms of performance, and the rate of uh, uh, unemployment is higher as compared to developed countries. But the government is trying its best to as much as possible to improve on the system. You know, as an emerging economy. Um, Definitely, you, 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 you'll be bound with unemployment situation. And even in advanced countries like the United States, it is not even possible to even create, let's say, one million or two million jobs in a year. How much more an emerging economy? So always, definitely, the quality of work, the standard of work, would definitely be lower in developing countries as compared to a developed country. So certainly I'll, I'll give you a view on that score. I know, but the private sector has also, um, at certain points, in, had misgivings um, about uh, the attention that they are given by the agencies or state agencies to the work that they are doing, citing disinterest and the fact that they think that the public sector or the ministers who have been put in um, positions should show interest in what they are doing. For instance, you have um, Blue Skies that employs quite a, a huge number. And so recently when TV3 went there, um, they said there was no official from the states or minister who had visited them until just last week when the trade minister visited. Um, with the private sector seeing this, not being able to share their concerns, how would you as agencies now begin to look at them because if they have more, then perhaps they could uh, be looking further in terms of employment. Uh, uh, definitely, um, it sits very well with the vision of His Excellency the President. And his vision is to provide the enabling environment for private businesses to strive. And um, how do we do it? If, for instance, about three or four years ago, we are having energy crisis where we didn't have stable light and the companies had to rely on fuel um, generators which brought about increased cost of production and you talk about high rate of interest rate inflation all these things are inimical to private sector's development but as i speak to you now interest rates are coming down inflation rates are coming down if we have fairly stable um, energy situation in the country now in a way, it's a plus uh, for private business and also the government because hitherto, if your cost of production was high and you have to invest more to buy uh, fuel to power your genset, if going for loan in the banks, it was, the rate was around 28% and now it's around 19%. These things go in the medium term to cushion the company or companies to have more resources. It's when they have more resources that they can recruit yes, people. Yes, but, but, but if they, they perhaps would be, in your mind, you are creating the environment for them to be able to get the resources to do the employment. Yeah. But you are not interacting with them. So how do you detect the emerging problems that come even as you deal with those that you know? Uh, and that's where they are concerned. And, and, and you just made mention of one company, but mm. I don't know to like that extent. Uh, the number of companies who have similar uh, uh, issues. But I know it's not just the Ministry of Trade or uh, certain ministries. We have several agencies of government which have a role in supporting private companies. We talk of Free Zone, Ghana Export Promotion, Ghana Investment Promotion, even YEA. There are several agencies that deal with private institutions. So it's case by case. Study. And it depends on what the issues are. Is YEA also in touch with a lot of these um, industries to be able to know what their concerns are because you'll be sending people to them? Yes, um, to be honest with you, it's something that was lacking in the agency uh, until we decided to think outside the box. Uh, for your information, every year 
according to the Ghana Living Standard Survey, that was even around 2012, 2013, we have 250,000 young men and women coming out, whether from the school or attaining the, uh, the, the, the labor age. And out of the 250,000, only 2% can be absorbed by the public sector. That is the government institution. Then 98 percent will have to and find themselves. Government is the largest employer. If, if collectively, if if yes. want to look at it, so imagine so if only two percent. Then 98 percent have to find their way in the informal sector. And so the informal sector is it, okay. Informal sector, sector. Not, not only the private sector, but the informal. The, inf the, informal, so the informal includes the private sector, private, private sector. company. So, as an agency, we we thought why that. We cannot just rely on our normal models that we develop, like the community police, community nursing, youth in fire service. The highest number that we have had as an agency is around 120,000 that can be, that people that we could have recruited. Okay. But we have 250,000 coming out every year. Every year. So we need to, we needed to go beyond what we are doing. So that is why our agency have introduced the YEA Job Center. And that seeks to coordinate between ourselves, the state institutions, the private institutions, and even government institutions to identify job opportunities in the country and even outside the country. So that's how we have been engaging the private sector. And truly, uh, since we started this exercise, we have had several private companies on board who are even willing to assault their recruitment and also to partner us in doing advert for them in terms of job opportunity. The problems that we have had in this country is information. Most of the time you hear of job opportunities, even by the time you even try it, it's over. And there's a perception in Ghana now that if you don't know any big man, if you don't know, have, don't have connections in government, or you don't have friends, job. you can get a job. We are in constant touch with institutions, both private and public, at least let Ghanaian youth know of the job opportunities and let them try and see if they'll get it. Aside that, we are in a global village now. There are several multinational, international companies, even outside Ghana. So as an agency, it is our duty to facilitate the process, to identify the jobs wherever they, they are all over the world and to give opportunity for Ghanaian youth to also apply. So that is what our agency is trying to do, position ourselves as a proper employment agency. You know, if you are familiar with um, the UK system, you have job centers across the length and breadth of the country where you can walk to any place, register your details, find out the jobs in your localities, or even jobs across uh, United Kingdom or other areas. That is something that we are trying to do. Then one problem that we have also identified is that you have industry players complaining about the kind of graduates that come out from university and the kind of jobs that are available. And most of the time they say that what they learn in school is different from what is in the, is in the industry. So as an agency, I also thought it why that we don't have enough jobs. So even with the limited ones that we have, it bestows on us to train people to suit the requirement from the industry so that it wouldn't be that oh, you have graduates, but they don't qualify, and we have to bring uh, uh, expatriates to come and fill those, those vacancies. And Every year we have 250,000 young men and women, young men and women employable Ooh. young men and women coming out of the universities and all other sectors ready to be employed. Only 2 to 10 percent? Only 2 percent. Only 2 percent. Can be absorbed at the public sector. Only 2 percent absorbed <laughs> at the public sector. In the public sector. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of work needs to be done. Definitely. Justin, thank you for joining us on Captured by Women. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you. We have been discussing unemployment with Mr. Justin Kodia Frimpong, the CEO of the Youth Employment Agency, YEA. Coming up next is a Rosewood business. How lucrative is this? Stay with us. We'll be right back from the break. Despite the ban on felling and logging of Rosewood, there continues to be the illegal felling 
logging and also the export of rosewood, especially to China. And Ghana and Nigeria are the leading corporates to this. In here to discuss it, we have Gideon Ofosu Piasa, and he's a natural resources economist, also a member of the University Council of the University of Energy and Natural Resources. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Six million trees felled so far, at least. Are we aware of what we are doing to ourselves, especially in the communities that these trees um, have grown in? I can't say we grew it because we met them. Okay, thank you very much for having me. Um, you can look at it from the angle of sustainability and then the role that tree plays in our environment. What trees um, does is that they sequester carbon. So they take in the CO2 in the daytime and then in the night they give us um, um, oxygen. So what it means is that if we are bringing down these trees, then it means that we would be, we as human beings will be the ones who will be inhaling this um, CO2 and then it will be harmful to our bodies. And then there is also a direct relationship between the number of trees that we have and then the amount of rainfall that we have. Um, again, bringing down trees also has implications on the flora and then the fauna that, that we have in our em environment. So these are key issues that we need to look at. We have, these trees are in nine of our 16 regions. That is more of it. Do the communities know the effects of this? Because it takes a hundred years to get a mature tree for rosewood. Have they been, has there been an, enough awareness to that effect? Okay, so prior to that, um, prior to 2008, what do you realize is that um, the local people um, did not know the economic value of rosewood. So um, they used it for preparing medicines. The oil was extracted and then was used in um, dealing with asthma and then um, dealing with um, respiratory tract in infections. Um, the branches were used for firewood. Um, it was used for parts of xylophones and then all that. Right up to um, 2012, whereby um, uh, people realized that um, this is what we call the red gold in quotes and then it has a lot of economic value and then the attention came on that. So the people in the communities then did not know and then um, it is now that these brouhaha on the felling and then the illegal harvesting of rosewood that probably um, the local people are beginning to realize the um, economic importance of r rosewood. Rosewood is almost one, is one of the extinct species. I think we are classifying it as extinct. Um, however, the ban um, on felling of rosewood was in effect, was put in effect 1st January 2014 by the previous government. We have 214 to 219, that's five years. Forestry Commission, what are the other authorities? What are the the organizations that are involved when a ban on a species like that is put in place, who is failing us? Okay, so um, thank you very much. Um, in Ghana, um, the first um, official ban was announced in 2012 by the late Professor Atamels. Okay. And then um, during those um, times, what they did was that they, he ordered the confiscation of tracks um, filled with rosewoods. And then it was then that we also heard that these tracks were getting vanished. So um, it's been um, announced in 2014 and then re recently it's, it's just a way of reminding ourselves of, um, of a ban that we have placed on ourselves way back in 2012. Um, there is um, an international convention known as CITES. The yes. full meaning is the um, Convention um, for International um, Trade on um, Endangered Species for Wild Flora and, and then Fauna. They had already had these discussions on um, endangered spe species. Um, they were endangered because of two main reasons. That is number one, um, climatic actions. And then um, the second has to do with human actions towards um, these um, flora and then fauna. But the campaign about Rose Root um, and then the stands on it became very strong in um, January 2017. But prior to that, uh, many nations had already imposed local bans. Madagascar imposed a ban somewhere in 2012, yeah. um, uh, um, 2010, sorry, and then the, that of Ghana in, in, in 2012. So um, when there is a ban, usually um, it is not um, written in black and ink on a paper. 
So it is usually a directive from the president or a directive from the minister. And then as a matter of fact, the organizations or the institutions that should ensure that this ban comes into effect um, has to do with the ministry providing oversight. That is the Ministry for Lands and Natural Resources. Okay. Let, let me add one more question yeah. there. In, uh, in the road construction, you know, there are a lot of, the, the rosewood grows wild. It's not someone who has purposely uh, planted it because these, these take about 100 years to grow. Now, when it's been, roads are being constructed and these trees are felled, what happens to these ones? And is an environmental impact assessment done by the road, urban roads before these trees are felled? Okay, so um, these um, trees um, are categorized under what we call salvage trees. If you are constructing a road, for example, the Fufusu Solar Road, there were lots of roads woods which had to come down to pave way for the construction of roads. Um, in the construction of the Bui Dam, there were lots of road routes which had to pave way for the construction of these dams. And then if I own a farm and then I have rose wood on it, um, I determine um, as to whether the rose wood stays or leaves. Because if I need um, a vast um, area for, for cultivation, then I would have to determine that. So um, this has been the issues around that. So um, the government started institute, um, giving what, what we call them salvage permits for those um, salvage woods to be conveyed and then those could be conveyed. traded. Okay. Yes, those could be traded and both on the local market and then the international market. But unfortunately, people have abused them. People have abused them and then um, they are bringing down these streets in, in the name of these streets being salvaged. Okay, so what is accounting for this, uh, the increase rather when there's a brand? because there should, there's several levels where you have certificates for you to be able to transport and export them. Okay, so um, it can be attributed to two main things. Um, there is a demand locally and then there is a demand um, globally. Um, at the domestic level, um, the demand has to do with these wood serving as a source of energy. Um, people do um, get them for firewood, for heating, cooking and then all that. So that has to do with the um, local demand and then to an extent for medicinal purposes and then for the manufacturing of um, musical instruments. But at the global level, um, especially China, um, China receives um, not less than 96% of our total rosewood um, exports. There is a wider market and then a ready market. It is used in the manufacturing of um, um, furniture, the backs of guitar, gun bats, yachts, and then um, etc. etc. The floors that we see um, in these um, first class hotels, all of these are, 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 are from rosewood. And then, um, as the name suggests, rosewood, the oil which comes out of it has a, a very nice and then a sweet smell. So, it is also very, very, very much used in the perfume I industry too. So um, there is a demand for it both domestically and then globally. That is the reason why there is a rise um, in, um, in, in, in the f um, harvesting of rosewood. But we've also cited from the report that um, was done um, in the investigations that indicated that there's been a kind of collision between authorities and the people who are illegally logging this and it, it goes through the system up to the export level. What kind of monitoring mechanism do we have to be able to get the actors involved in this illegal logging and export? Okay, well, well you realize that um, the oversight or, or the regulatory body has to do with the Forestry Commission. But um, if you work in such an institution and then there is some level of political influences. I have a friend, um, he, he's a district forest manager, and then he always causes the arrest of these people. But the following day, what he hears is that these people have been released because of an order for um, above. So it's, um, it's kind of um, demoralizes those who would want to do the right thing. So people have to sometimes give up um, um, and then say that, okay, if this is what is going to happen, then we, we will all be part of the rot. So we, we, we would also ensure that the, 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 the wrong things are done. And then the people in the communities too, what ha happens is that um, when um, this harvest is done, um, per the last time I checked, the traditional councils or the local rulers um, take some sums of money, probably around 500 cities, the local people take some amount of money. And then when you look at the district, um, um, assemblies. They don't take less than 1,500 cities for 
um, a 20 feet foot of um, rose wood. And then um, before you can receive a conveyance certificate at the district level to the um, Forestry Service Division of the Forest Commission also takes um, fees around um, 2,000 cities. So that's amount to somewhere around um, 5,000 cities. Before, if it can be e e exported, the Timber Development um, Division of the Forestry Commission also takes somewhere around um, 2,000 cities. Um, that amounts to about 7,000. And then the GRA would also have to take some fees. So we realize that um, the, that is the value chain. And then until we think about um, formalizing this sector, um, the illegalities will, will continue and, and then the country would lose a lot. We, we have, as a country, also um, emphasized a lot on conservation of the environment. But with this particular one, we've had, for instance, TV3 has had reports on this from 2012 up till now. And consistently, you realize that environments that are in the savanna areas are rather suffering for this particular illicit activity. How do we, as a people, help stabilize the environment through conserving these trees? Okay. So, um, as a natural resource economist, cutting of trees is not wrong. But the caveat is, your rate of harvest should be lesser than the rate of natural replenishment. So what it means is that your rate of harvest at no point should, should not be more than the its natural rate of replenishing. So if we are to understand this concept that, okay, we would want to depend on trees as a source of livelihood, then we must put in effort um, yeah. to plant more so that it will become sustainable. And then um, together with research, we can now get um, reduce the, 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 the period in, in which um, um, a tree should grow. Um, over 50 years, over 100 years, with research, we, we can get um, hybrid um, forms of um, trees whereby with a shorter um, 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 duration, they can be harvested. Have we done this for the rosewood? Have seedlings for the tree seedlings for the rosewood yes, being so, um, cultivated? I, I'm aware that um, the, 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 the Forestry Committee, um, the Forestry Commission is um, um, embarking on some, some, some um, on a project to plant rosewoods in, in all the regions of Ghana. And then I know that um, the Forest Research Institute of the CSIR mm -hmm. is also conducting research into that area to ensure that we have um, a new breed of rosewood that will have a shorter um, um, maturity. maturity. Yeah, yes, period, but yeah. communities in, <laughs> who have these, uh, this rosewood um, educated enough to know how to handle it because these are the communities that are being exploited as we speak. Yeah, I'm not sure these communities are educated enough. Mm. I'm not sure these communities are ed ed educated enough and then we need Which to... Which authority would be responsible for disseminating or sensitizing more information to these communities, in the pro preferably in their local languages as well, so that we don't have the types of Helen Huang, the Chinese lady felling trees and just get a slap on the wrist by being deported. Yeah, so um, we have the... Is it still the Forest Commission? Because they have um, offices at, at the district levels too, and then so the Forest Commission can work in tandem with the um, NCCE, who do have the skill when it comes to um, community entry and then educating these people. They can work together together with civil society in order to ensure that um, the people are educated. Yes, but you, you're talking about the, um, the Forest Commission. You've mentioned agencies. One of the things that have the, the, one of the issues that have come out has been the issue of politicizing the giving out of um, certificates for you to be able to fell these trees. And it's basically going to the party in power. Whoever is in power has the, um, its members as corporates. With this particular one that has international um, agreements to it, how do we as a people get them accountable enough and punish them to be a deterrent to others? So um, for me, um, drawing lessons from the mining sector, Galam C, um, I am always of the view that punishment should always be the last resort. You realize that people would want to do it because they see it as a source of livelihood. So how then do you formalize it, open it up, 
so that people can come from the right permitting, they can come from the right licenses, so that you'd have the opportunity to even gather data on, on the number of people who are interested in this trade, so that you can have customized programs for them, and then identify them and then educate them. So for me, I am of the view that punishment should be the last resort. Of course, if uh, people go to the extreme, you need to punish to serve as a but, deterrent, but, but we need to formalize the sector. But don't we need to punish? Because you have a situation where you had about five or four tracks been uh, delivering in convoy in, yes and it was that not any other violation. person but Ghanaians who were leading them out of this country no, haven't we gotten to that point already we need to punish um, again drawing lessons from the galamsey sector the ban was imposed some people were punished but they now changed their modus operandi to work in the night once it is a source of livelihood, people would always find a way out of it. So there's a low there's, level there's... of vigilance from the authorities. Because they would... the Forestry Commission must be alert at all times. They should be. But or they are conniving with the tree fellers. To, to an extent, there is some form of um, co collusion. And that is where, I, I, in my opinion, there must be some punitive measures. Because these trees, none of us, not my parents, nor we built these trees, uh, planted these trees. These trees are 100 years old or they are felling younger ones. These are trees and new seedlings are yet to be planted. So we are, in other words, depleting the entire uh, stock of mature trees that there are. Yes, so um, punishments, I agree. The Forestry Commission, the EPA should be vigilant and then all that. Yes. But what do you do on the other hand? On the other hand, whilst you are punishing those who have violated the rules, then you put in measures to uh, grow new trees. Sure. And, so, like you said, register the ones who formalize, who are in, the, formalize the system. So that it becomes a legal business, it is well regulated, so that the harvesting will be done in a sustainable manner. But this, all this should have been done already. Um, We've had the commission for years, since government. Yes. 50 years old. Um, I know that um, there are ongoing discussions um, at, at, at that level to try to formalize the sector and then to also ensure that the right can extend. Okay. All right. So thank you very much for the insights, Gideon Ufusupiasa, natural resources economist and member of the University Council of the University of Energy and Natural Resources. Thank you very much for having me. You're welcome. Thank you. Viewers, we'll be right back. So Eliza, what are you taking home this week? What did we talk about? A few. Rosewood. Um, a ban was initially put to 212, 214. But I'm surprised to hear the ban doesn't actually, it's not written and posted anywhere. It's actually Annie. announced on air by certain government and then that's it. Whether it's implemented or not. Does it question the commitment of the government? Oh yes, it does. It does because if you know the value of this um, species, of this tree, and it's being depleted, and we are not making any arduous efforts to replace them, and um, you find connivance with authorities, when you, f when you actually apprehend a Chinese, well, what was her name, Helen Wang, she didn't go to court, she was deported. That doesn't show, that's not right. You know, the monitoring system is also questionable because you find that a lot of the time, from the report of the Environmental Investigation Agency, um, at the ports you have forged documents. You have people who pay through the process to be able to take it out to the extent that you even have it being escorted by officials who should rather be and catching these people. And, and I know our resource person, Mr. Um, Ofosu Piasa, was of the opinion that punitive measures should not be um, in, in But used. that's hell no. No, 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 no. Because no. once you are able you to must take punish it to them. the port, you, found them to you the have port. to be punished. That's criminal. That is criminal. Mm. If we were found to be doing that, we'll be arrested. And the unfortunate, the unfortunate thing in all these corruption issues is somebody goes to steal plantain, a finger of plantain, and will be five jailed years. for five years. You'll be jailed for and, five and, years. And you have these people it sends who wrong are signals. fattening themselves on our resources. 
going to this level. This is just as bad as gold, Galam say. This is just as bad. And I think, yeah, I mean, it has been insightful. We're learning more about it. The rosewood is used by the top class, top notch institutions, expensive boats. None of us here, well, maybe some of us, will see the, where this rosewood will be used. There are yachts, um, the best floor parquet in the top mm. seven, five, seven star hotels, the butts of uh, okay. uh, rifles, mm. the most expensive rifles, is the most expensive of case. any product that is used. So we should protect these species. Mm. So viewers, make a date with us again next week, same time and same place or same channel. My name is Matilda Abahins. Elizabeth Olympia Emmanuel. And this program has been sponsored by Woodin, Woodin Le Create, and Emerald Sweets. Make a date with us again next week. Have a pleasant afternoon.